Hello, my name is Jeffrey Nicholas, and I'm an Associate Professor of Philosophy at Providence College. This is a short lecture on Alastair McIntyre's essay, Social Structures and Moral Agency. What I want to do is just uh, go over the particular argument uh, in McIntyre's essay, but to give you an overview of where we're headed, uh, I summarize his uh, thesis as following. The social structures of contemporary life threaten moral agency through fragmentation where duties are assigned according to roles and individuals are complicit in this fragmentation. Now, as I go through the essay, I will give some examples uh, to help clarify McIntyre's meaning. But the idea here is rather simple, that we engage in various social structures like institutions that make us compromise our own moral agency and in doing so, we are complicit in the compromise of our moral agency. So this is a fairly damning critique of the social structures of contemporary life and of our own acceptance of those social structures. To begin, we have to understand what moral agency is. So to kind of give us an idea of what he's talking about, McIntyre says that a moral agent has to be responsible for his actions or her actions in three ways. Uh, the moral agent has to be responsible for the intentional effects of the action. So what did the uh, agent intend to do uh, with the action that uh, she uh, did? Then there are the incidental effects, which we should be aware of. So there might be incidental effects which we are not responsible for being aware of. Uh, so if you're a fan of the chaos theory, you know, if you wave your hand, that might cause a hurricane somewhere in East Asia, but of course we can't be aware of that kind of uh, incidental effect. Uh, he's talking more about other kinds of more relevant incidental effects. And then there are predictable effects that we should also uh, be held responsible for. So to give an example of what McIntyre is talking about here, I refer the viewer to uh, the famous Harry Potter series, and in particular Professor Dumbledore's relationship to Harry's education. Uh, Harry has at this point uh, been uh, or found uh, Voldemort alive and uh, he knows that he can uh, be contacted or connected with Voldemort uh, through a sort of mental link uh, probably uh, from his scar. So Dumbledore does not want himself uh, to be so exposed to Voldemort. So what he does is he isolates Harry Potter uh, from himself. Uh, so Professor Dumbledore tries not to uh, associate with Harry Potter, keeps him out of his office, and does not train him in the uh, particular spell that uh, Harry Potter most needs uh, to uh, protect himself from Voldemort, and gives that job to Professor Snape. So the intentional effect is to isolate Harry Potter from Voldemort, and Professor Dumbledore intends to do that, and that is, he is responsible for that. The incidental effect, which uh, uh, Dumbledore should have been aware of, is that this is going to give more power to Snape. And at the end of the movie and the text in which this occurs, uh, Dumbledore says uh, that he's sorry to Harry Potter. Uh, he didn't realize the kind of aggravation that Snape had built up from the torture that he had received from uh, Harry Potter's parents, uh, or at least from Harry Potter's father. Uh, Dumbledore should have been aware of this, and it's sort of uh, odd that he wasn't, given the kind of wisdom that he's uh, shown to have throughout the rest of the series. And finally, there are predictable effects. By not training uh, Harry himself, he exposes Harry Potter to Voldemort uh, in pivotal scenes, and that leads to the uh, death of a major character. Um, this is predictable, uh, in my opinion, because uh, Dumbledore is the most expert in the spell that Harry Potter needs, and rather than teach Harry Potter himself, uh, he gives that job over to someone else. So he uh, risks uh, exposing Harry Potter to Voldemort. Uh, so for Dumbledore to have full moral, moral agency, he needs to be held responsible, and he needs to recognize himself as responsible for the intentional effects, the incidental effects, and the predictable effects. And in the end of the book, he does take that responsibility, uh, as we see at the beginning of uh, uh, book six, when Dumbledore uh, 
changes his course and then starts training uh, Harry Potter himself. Moral agency then means that we have to also be able to discriminate between different kinds of cases, right? So if we have obligations, uh, some obligations might come with negative effects that are gonna harm that particular person, but may not harm other people. Whereas other types of obligations, if we honor them, could harm other people. So McIntyre draws the distinction between giving an award to someone who we know uh, will become more arrogant because they've won the award and uh, returning a gun to someone who we know wants to uh, shoot uh, his spouse with the gun. Uh, so here, uh, there is a difference in the level of agency that we have uh, if we return, if we follow the obligations, because there's, there are competing obligations here. Obviously, we should not return the gun uh, to someone if we know that they're going to shoot someone else. Uh, but giving an award to someone, even if we know that that might lead to them being more arrogant, uh, is more acceptable in this case. What these distinctions show for McIntyre is that we have to be able to, and we must, put our standards to question. If we have obligations, we must be able to, to question those. That's part of agency. So agency for McIntyre is not simply following rules or doing what uh, an authority figure says. In fact, it requires us to do more than that, to question the rules and to question what the moral authority says. Uh, that is full moral agency. So how do we identify as a moral agent? Uh, well, there are three uh, steps here. First, we understand and present ourselves as someone with an identity outside of my role. Uh, so as a professor uh, at a college, I have particular, uh, a particular role that I have to fill, uh, but my identity is not simply the role that I have. Uh, so I have to question, be willing to question that and to present myself as someone who is more than just a uh, particular person in a particular role. Uh, when we look at the Milgram experiments, if you're familiar with these, um, Milgram uh, conducted some experiments uh, to see how far uh, people would follow authority. And in the experiment, uh, what he does is he has someone uh, carry out a scientific experiment at the authority of uh, a scientist. Um, and the objective is to see, well, will this person, because uh, she or he is fulfilling a particular role, go all the way in terms of harming someone. And what Milgram uh, discovered was that 50% uh, of people uh, did in fact go all the way in terms of uh, shocking someone even to uh, death. So these people who did that uh, were not able to step outside of their role. They did not have that identity and so they couldn't identify as a moral agent. Second, I have to understand myself as practically rational. Uh, so I, I have to do more than just uh, follow rules. I have to be able to justify the judgments I make on the basis of goods that I'm pursuing and the values that I have. So we have to do more here than follow efficiency. Uh, today, what we see over and over again uh, in politics and in business is that people will justify their actions based merely on efficiency. This is going to make me a dollar. Uh, this is going to help serve the bottom line. This is going to help us win the election. And that is not uh, justifying my judgments on the basis of goods and values, but only on the basis of efficiency. Uh, so I have to be aware of what my goods are and what the values are that I hold in order to act as a moral agent. And finally, uh, I must identify in and through social um, milieus that I'm a part of, I must become accountable for the judgments uh, that I have as a virtuous person and not just as a person in a particular role. So there's a tension here that McIntyre is drawing out between the good of the person and the good of the role-bearing individual. And we have to, uh, if we want to be moral agents, uh, prioritize our role as persons over our role as uh, uh, people-bearing, uh, role-bearing individuals. So to give you an example of, uh, here, I want to look at Pope Francis. Pope Francis obviously has a particular role. He's Pope of the Roman Catholic Church with a billion plus members, and he has to protect and help teach the doctrine of the church. 
Uh, and part of the doctrine means that uh, includes uh, the uh, condemnation of homosexual marriage and homosexual acts, even though it does not include the condemnation of homosexuality or homosexual individuals. And uh, when uh, the Pope is asked about this, he says, well, who am I to judge these individuals? So he's trying to, to, to make a distinction between his role as Pope with these teaching duties and his role as a person uh, and, in relationship to particular individuals. Uh, he also defends his moral positions on the basis of reasons available to everyone. Uh, so if you're familiar with Laudato Si, it's the Pope's uh, argument for taking care of the planet. And he doesn't just argue on the basis of uh, theology or a biblical scholarship. He does do that, but he also argues on the basis of everyday reason. And this is something we find uh, in most of the major uh, writings of uh, the Catholic intellectual tradition, uh, including uh, Thomas Aquinas in his discussion of, of natural law. And finally, he recognizes himself, the Pope does, within a larger milieu of judgment, right? Uh, what is the good of the person? What is the good of the Pope? And how do I balance those out so that the, the good of the person uh, supersedes the good of just being a Pope? Uh, Edward Snowden is another example, maybe closer to home uh, to those of you who are in the United States. Uh, here is someone who worked for the CIA and knew about the uh, NSA uh, spying program, and he had to make a judgment between his role within the CIA and the human good. And he judged uh, to uh, violate the role in order to protect the human good. This is an example, of, of course, of human agency. Uh, one of the values that he was trying to uh, uh, protect was privacy. And uh, he suffered uh, for this, uh, going into a self-imposed exile to protect Americans um, rather than being arrested or tortured or however, whatever might happen uh, within the United States. So two examples of the kinds of things uh, that are required for identifying as a moral agent. Now, the greatest threat to moral agency in social structures is compartmentalization. So McIntyre writes that each distinct sphere of social activity comes to have its own role structure, uh, role structure governed by its own specific norms and relative independence of other such spheres. Uh, so we have different roles and different norms as a family man uh, or a family woman, as a corporate person, and as a lawyer. Uh, and so McIntyre gives an example of someone who uh, has an irreplaceable love for his family, uh, but is unwilling to... Uh, 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 understand that corporations have negative effects on uh, families and hurts the loved ones there and the lawyer sees uh, this kind of situation as a means to income. This uh, conflict and tension uh, is within the different spheres that, spheres that we have in life and what McIntyre is trying to point out here is that uh, we do not unify our actions uh, seeking uh, the good of human life and seeking the kind of values and goods that we hold uh, most uh, dear. So someone who actually holds family as dear uh, would not, uh, within a corporation, uh, cause other peoples to sacrifice uh, their family lives. In order to resist compartmentalization and to exercise moral agency, we need two uh, particular virtues that are not often talked about. and Those are integrity and constancy. Uh, McIntyre defines integrity as to refuse to be, to have educated oneself so that one is no longer able to be one kind of person in one social context and another kind in another context. A classic example here, of course, would be Socrates, who refused to compromise his values when threatened with death and offered a chance to escape. Uh, he said, look, I'm not going to escape my job. My, my life has been dedicated to the state. If the state turns on me, that doesn't mean that I should run in fear from that. Uh, so he had integrity throughout his life. Uh, we see the same thing with Edward Snowden. Uh, constancy then is defined as the pursuit of, of the same set of goods over a period of time, not allowing requirements of changing social contacts to distract one or redirect one's activities. Uh, and here a good example would be Severus Snape, who did not allow the rise of Voldemort and the death of Dumbledore to distract him from protecting Harry Potter and ending uh, Voldemort's reign. So here we have a particular good that Snape is pursuing uh, that keeps him uh, constant in the face of different struggles uh, within his life. Uh, so that's uh, McIntyre's uh, essay on moral agency and social structures and how we can exercise moral agency uh, within the modern world.
Thank you.